This took place in the summer of 2004, around July, in the Bristol Bay County. I am a commercial fisherman in Alaska and have been doing so since 1970. I'm an avid outdoorsman, hunter, and someone who just loves to get out there. Every year after fishing, I try to take a trip upriver with a friend or two to wind down and enjoy ourselves before we go home. This year, while I was on this trip into Alaska's interior, our main mission was to take pictures of bears and the surrounding wildlife to promote a new bear viewing and sports fishing business. While on our five-day trip, we spotted more than 40 bears. I took hundreds of pictures of these bears and their tracks, one of which was so big it put chills up my spine and gave me and my companions a very uneasy sense of insecurity. What set this track apart from the others was its enormous size and human-like shape. In one of the pictures that I took of this track, I placed my foot next to it on the ground. Keep in mind I'm wearing a size 13 boot. Whatever made this track was so heavy, heavier than the biggest bear, that it pushed the gravel so far into the earth that it made us truly speculate what we were looking at. Other pictures that we took of the bear tracks were nowhere close to that indentation that this track had left. One of the most intriguing things about this track, where there were no visible claw marks, is with all the other bear tracks. Both of us felt extremely uneasy of our surroundings and had the feeling that we were being watched. For the rest of the day, we didn't have much to talk about, and that night felt uncomfortable at camp. We never heard or smelt anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I am not really sure what we saw, and I'm not making any claims other than the words I have put forth. I've only heard of one other story, from an old native man that lived by himself, a true hermit. He spoke of a tall creature that walked on two legs, and watched him for 30 minutes from across the river, which his cabin overlooked approximately 200 feet away. When first sighted, he was motionless, staring straight at him. Then this creature, which he named Hairy Man, turned and briskly walked away. My hiking partner and I arrived to the Kennecott area. We were trying to make it to the campsites near the glacier, but it started to get too dark, even for us. So we decided to camp at the first available site. We found a small spot right off the trail so we made camp and hung our supplies in a tree down the trail. Started a fire and were just finishing a small meal when I walked to the trail to smoke. I was standing on a trail a few minutes when I noticed what I thought was a man on the bike coming down the trail. I let my partner know, but when I looked back it was still in the same spot. I started looking more closely to see a face or the bike or something. It was then I realized it was not a person. It was a large dark form, legs spread apart. This is what led me to think it was a person on a bike. The arms were curled at its side like someone with hands on handlebars. Too big for a bear, and the legs were too far apart. I called my partner, but when turned back to look at it again, it moved very quickly into the woods on two legs. The next day we looked but found no evidence of anything on the trail. I've told this story to a few people, but they all think I'm crazy. I hope this helps. I know what I saw. I guess I'm just hoping somebody believes me. My hunting buddy and I were sitting on a ridge, watching for caribou. About a thousand yards away, and a large clearing was in view. While we were glassing the clearing for a caribou to come out of the brush, we watched a large gray animal walking on hind legs walk between two large spruce trees on opposite sides of the clearing. We were both longtime Alaskans, avid hunters, and have logged many, many hunts in North America. I have hunted all of the North America's deer, elk, black, and grizzly bear. I have never seen an animal like what we saw that day. We watched it for over half an hour move from one tree across the clearing to the other tree. Eventually, caribou moved into the area and we lost sight of the animal when it moved off into heavy, thick brush. We had never heard of a Bigfoot in Alaska, but we did tell the bush pilot that picked us up from our hunt that we had seen something strange. 
He told us we had probably seen the Hairy Man, a well-known animal of the region by the native people. Me and a couple of friends had been bored one December when I decided we should take a walk through the woods behind my house. I didn't think much of it as me and my friend have done it many times before. There were four of us and we set out about 11 o'clock at night. It was rather dark but there was light from the moon. The weather was rather cold as we did this in the winter. The area we walked on was game trails. Trails that moose normally walk on as well as trails used for mushers, runners, cross-country skiers, and that sort. We had walked about two miles from my house to another entrance where most people enter. On the way, we had talked about unexplainable events or things such as Bigfoot or UFOs. When we reached the bridge where most people come in, one friend had smoked a cigarette. We then saw a light and decided to go on. On the way back, we heard a wild dog barking wildly and decided to pick up the speed. It eventually became a sprint where after we walked. When we walked, we continued talking about it. It was then I realized something had been following us, as well as testing us or even harassing us. It was much earlier, I just didn't think about it. I thought it was my friend Warren, who is sometimes clumsy. I thought it was him who had made noises such as slipping but it was really something throwing something at us. I had realized this was about halfway back. I asked if Warren kept slipping when he told me it wasn't and he thought I could have been pulling a prank on him. We stopped for a minute to listen when I told the others something strange was going on. We stopped and shone a flashlight around hearing noises such as steps and branches moving and breaking. The leader had thought I had been playing a joke when I told him seriously I wasn't. He decided to walk behind with me when something threw snowballs and nearly hit us on many occasions. It was then he realized that this was no joke and we picked up a light jog for most of the way. When we were almost out of the woods, we heard dogs again, maybe 20 feet away, the branches breaking and again something throwing stuff at us. By the time we left, it was about 3 to 3.30 in the morning. I did not go directly to my house because I didn't know if it was still following us. I knew this was not a prank because the snow is more than 5 feet deep in the woods and someone would have had an extremely hard time to play a prank like that. This was in February of 2004, up near power line clearings east of Potter Marsh out of Anchorage. I and two of my friends were bored one night, so we decided to do a little snow machining. Thought it was illegal to snow machine in Anchorage and there were some good trails to ride on a little north of my house. We took off probably at around 11 p.m., rode up and around a quarter mile and cut off on the trails. It had snowed about 10 inches a few days before, so there was fresh snow with no tracks. I was leading the way for about a half an hour and then we stopped and talked for a little bit. We took off again and kept cruising on some sort of game trail that led to an opening in the woods. I rode off into the openings with my friends, following about 50 yards behind me. I came over this little mound and saw strange tracks leading to this spot in the snow where it looked like something had pushed aside some snow and laid down. I figured it was just a moose or something but I followed the tracks over the next small hill and as I came down the far side, my headlight pointed right at the back of a Bigfoot. It was only about 10 to 12 feet in front of me. It was running in the opposite direction. I slammed on the brakes because I was scared out of my mind. It continued to run away, jumped over a dead log covered in snow and disappeared into a group of trees into the darkness. I was so surprised and scared, I quickly turned around and rode back towards my friends. I met them back by the first mound and said, we need to get out of here, and rode back towards my house. When I told them about it back near my house, they laughed and told me it was probably a bear or somebody in the woods. But I was 100% positive that this was not a bear or anything else. The way it was running through the deep snow made me sure that it wasn't anything human. 
For a long time, I was made fun of, and everyone told me I was crazy, so I don't like talking about it. It was the month of July, 2009, in Fairbanks, Alaska. I was heading south on Auburn Drive towards Farmer's Loop, which was about a mile away. It was a wooded area, frequented by homes, and in general, would be considered a populated area. Houses are on average about 100 to 200 feet apart, with only the general area around the close to the homes cleared out. Most of the area by far is wooded. It was the section of road where it passes by Pearl Creek Elementary School. The school can be seen through the woods. Some of the woods in the area are quite thick and in some places can't be seen into more than about 10 or 15 feet. But in this area, it had apparently been cleaned out quite a bit and sight lines into the sections of the siding were very open. The school and vegetable garden could be seen off to the right from the road I was on. It was about 6 p.m. and I was heading home after a day of working on a deck that I was building. The weather was clear with the sun high in the sky. As I was driving, I happened to notice a man standing by the right side of the road, about a hundred yards ahead. It was more of an unconscious recognition. There's nothing unusual about a man standing on the side of the road in this area. As I got within about 50 yards, I looked closer. That's no man. I said to myself. Shortly after that, one or two seconds, he bolts into the woods toward the school. He did it like a wild animal would do, if spooked. I didn't slow down until I got to the place where I saw him go to the woods, which is where I stopped. I could see him running away from the road, and when he was into the woods about 30 or so yards, he turned left and was now running parallel to the road in the same direction I was heading. I got a good look at him but not his face. I could have probably seen his face had I not been so mesmerized and had the presence of mind to look at it. I was busy noticing other things. His fur or hair looked to be about three to four inches all over the main part of his body. It was a reddish rusty color. I was mildly struck by how red it was, but it definitely had some rustiness to it. He was about six feet tall and looked to weigh around 200 pounds. He ran with a strange, hoppy kind of run. It wasn't a limp. With one foot he pushed off with was more than a normal running move. But the other foot he pushed off with propelled him upward, about a foot or less, and forward. I watched him until he disappeared into the woods. There was a road about a hundred yards ahead, and I took off to get it so I could turn right, and in twenty yards turn right again to the road that led to the school parking lot. The wooded area he was in was sort of a peninsula, and he seemingly had to be in there somewhere. The woods I was looking into from that angle were quite thick, and I didn't see him, and haven't seen him since. A little farther up on the right was the school garden that had people in it, around 7 to 10, which I'm now sorry I didn't stop to go and talk to them about it. The next day, I was driving in to work on the deck. I naturally slowed down in the area, and I saw him stopped actually, and was surveying the area when a couple walking their dogs were approaching. I flagged them down and told the story of what happened the evening before, and they told me that about a week ago, they were there with their dogs and they were on their way to the other side of the school property, by the soccer field, and three kids came running over to them saying, did you see Sasquatch? They also said that what appeared to be as a dad was with them who didn't seem excited about it. My conclusion to whether it was real or not is summed up for me saying, it was either real or there was a man in a very, very convincing costume. I reported it to the Fish and Game office in Fairbanks a couple of days later. The person who was taking the report was sort of rolling his eyes through the whole thing as he seemed to be writing it down on a piece of scrap paper. I even had to ask him to take my phone number just in case. I personally did not see it, but a non-commissioned officer I work with, along with his wife, child, and hunting buddy were on their way home when, according to them, a large, hairy, about seven foot tall ape looking thing crossed the road in front of them. From what I could gather, none of them are familiar with Bigfoot information. Anyway, they say it crossed the road which is about 35 feet in width 
in four to five steps. It seemed and disappeared into the brush on the other side, which leads to a river called the Chenna. Both of the guys have been hunting since childhood and are sure they know a bear when they see one. The thing crossed the road on its hind legs and, as we all agreed, yeah, a bear can raise up on its hind legs and even take a few clumsy steps. But cross a 35-foot road? No way. They say they even came back later and looked for tracks. He wasn't too sure, but he says he found some tracks that didn't look like any tracks he was familiar with. They were pointed inwards as a person who is what I call pigeon-toed. They heard or saw nothing else, but were a bit shook and headed home. The entire story seemed incredible to me because the incident took place on a military installation. I really don't want to get the guys involved because they fear ridicule. This happened in late August of 97 in a side valley of Goldstream Valley, a relatively populated area just north of Fairbanks. Although it's quite close to the Fairbanks area, and there are many houses and roads in the main part of Goldstream, the side valleys are still as wild as they were a thousand years ago. I was hunting rough grouse in one of these side valleys, I prefer not to say which one. I was on a south-facing aspen-covered hillside and had hunted all afternoon and evening, intending to spend the night out on the hill and hunt my way back in the morning. As I was making camp, a black bear almost walked right into me. I heard him coming from a ways off and scared him away before he got closer. Later on, it will become apparent why I mention this. So I was sleeping out in the open, no tent, under a spruce tree. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was awakened by something prowling around my camp, maybe 30 feet or so away from me, walking in a circle. I mentioned the bear before, and this was not a bear I heard in the night. My father is a hunting guide, and I literally grew up hunting bears. I know what a bear sounds like when it's walking. Whatever this thing was, it was walking on two legs, with a bit of a shuffling sound between each step, like it was dragging its feet just a bit. The leaves on the forest floor were dried like potato chips, and it was breaking a lot of branches. I could hear it and follow its movements quite distinctly. I have to say that I've spent a lot of time here in the Alaskan bush and have never before or since been truly afraid of anything I've encountered. But I don't mind saying on that particular night, I was literally shaking with fear. It, for whatever it was, circled my camp for what seemed like hours, but it was probably only five or so minutes. Finally, remembering something I once read about Indians' beliefs regarding woodsmen, I started talking to it albeit in a shaky voice, saying I wanted no trouble that night. The thing stopped dead in its tracks, and then a few moments later, I heard it trotting downhill, away from me. Talking to such a creature may sound kind of cornball, but all I know is that it worked. I've kicked myself for this many times since, but the next morning, I didn't bother to look for any tracks, hair, evidence, etc. I just packed up and resumed my hunting. I had no further trouble with the woodsman. As a final couple of notes, I do recall hearing kind of a low muttering sound as it was prowling around. Also, having since done some reading on Bigfoot sightings, I've noticed that a lot of people reported the animal having a strong, foul odor. However, I did not smell any particular odor, foul or otherwise. Most of the native peoples of Alaska seem to have stories about the woodsman or the bushman or even the hairy man. Other than this, I've never heard of anyone I know having an actual encounter with a woodsman in Alaska. I was part of a group of about a dozen army personnel training in the area. It was over summer on a warm, clear day, and this was around the Black Rapids Glacier, Alaska Richardson Highway south of Delta Junction. We were about tree line and had been camped there for several days. I was looking across the nearest valley when I spotted movement. It was on the base of a steep mountainside in bare, rocky terrain, with snow fields descending down the small gullies on the hillside. It was moving up the valley, about a half a mile away. 
when it crossed the snow, you could plainly see that this was not a bear. It walked upright with long strides and arms swinging and moved fast across the white snow. It was dark in color, like a bear. I have seen bears many times since in the same type of terrain, and they do not move like this did. It was too big and too fast to be a human. Bears can and do walk upright, but usually only for short distances when they need to see or smell something and need the height. They don't travel in this manner, and not in this difficult of terrain. I pointed it out to the other guys and we watched it until you could no longer see it. When it was out of the snow, it was hard to see against the rocks. We wanted to go look at the tracks, but everybody was scared to go down there. We had to sleep there that night and nobody would go outside after dark. The next day, we got out and never went back. 20 years later, I still would not go up there, even with a group and with guns. The only thing I have seen that looked like this is the descriptions of Bigfoot. I was telling a friend about this and he said he found tracks in the sand in Alaska, out by King Salmon. He said they were over two feet long but looked human. He has a lot of outdoor experience here and says they were in no way the tracks of a bear. This was also in a remote area where you don't see other people, only planes. Something that I would not believe unless I saw it just stepped up about 30 feet in front of me, stared at me, and kind of grunted and walked into the woods real quiet. I did have a rifle and a handgun on me because I was out hunting, but for some reason I did not feel threatened. Although I did turn around and head back to my car often, glancing over my shoulder. I did hear some cracking branches on several occasions and I heard a few low to high tones coming from the direction that the really tall thing, at least six feet, and shaggy dark brown thing went down and made me want to walk a little faster. That was some of those sounds that were answered from the other side of the road. Other than that though, no further sighting or hearing took place over the year. I should mention that this also occurred back in 1964 and I have not been able to put it out of my mind. It occurred on a small dirt road which was about 35 miles south of Fairbanks. This dirt road was directly off the Richardson Highway. Heading south, you take a left off the highway and this road led to an old camp near a small pond which was about two miles in. This is just a report from a native that said he saw a hairy person, about six to seven feet tall, all hair, casually walking across the dirt road by Skylack Lake. This specifically was Skylack Lake Road by Skylack Lake Road in Kenai Peninsula, off of the main highway back in the woods. This thing looked at him and stopped on the road and appeared surprised. Then it took off into the woods swiftly. He said it was very agile and quick. He was about 300 yards away from it. There was no snow on the ground yet. He said they looked at each other for a bit, and he loaded his single shot shotgun, cause he didn't know if it was friendly or not. He was going to run and tell the authorities, but he didn't say anything, and he didn't think anything or anyone would believe him. He was very serious as he was telling the story. I know the man, he is a very strong Christian. That was probably around late October or early November. This place is near Sterling, Alaska. The location is full of spruce forest. I've been there. It's secluded from the main highway and full of forest and lakes and mountains. This sighting goes back to the fall of 1992. A friend and I were driving back to Fairbanks from Anchorage. I was driving her truck a 1980 Dodge D50. These trucks sit very low to the ground and it was late at night and we were just about to the tourist area of the Denali Park. It wasn't winter yet, just before a corner, my lights hit something sitting on the yellow line in the middle of the road. The lights to this truck were grossly out of adjustment, so they were pointing right at the thing. It was sitting in the middle of the road with its legs pulled up to its chest and its arms folded over its knees. Its head was between its arms looking toward the ground. It had long, human-like hair. 
At first, I thought it was an orangutan. But then I thought to myself, what would orangutan be doing in the middle of nowhere in Alaska? I've lived here almost all of my life and there is no animal like this. I thought to myself the only way that could have been an orangutan if there's a circus out here and I knew that was not a possibility in such a remote area. I drove right next to it and I was at its level. If I had been going slow, I could have touched it easily. I was freaked out and thought I must be seeing things. Maybe I was tired. My friends saw it too. Although neither one of us said a word until we reached the gas station in the town of Healy, just past Denali. She said, did you see that? And I said, I thought I was seeing things. This spooked us so bad we didn't even say anything to each other about it until we were around other people. We have talked about this and still agree that we saw this thing. We were about to give up on trying to explain it to anyone else because no one believes us. We both have decided not to bring it up because no one believes it anyway. Why I feel this is so unusual is there's no animal native to Alaska that could resemble this thing in any way. We have bears, moose, caribou, porcupine, rabbits, etc. But none of these animals have knees or long reddish colored hair. I don't know how to explain it and I've given up trying because nobody believes it. They just think you're joking. I don't want to be harassed by any nuts. I just want to be able to share my genuine incident in case others have seen what I have. I was going for a drive back in the spring of 1995. I had three kids with me, my daughters and one of their cousins. It was starting to get dark and I decided I wanted to turn around and not go all the way down the sort of yard. So I pulled into a turnaround. I had the car lights on, just in the bushes on the other side of the road though. I noticed some movement. I thought it might have been a deer, so I stopped the car entirely. The first thing I really saw was really bright blue eyes. Then I noticed how far up they were. The thing had to be about 8 to 9 feet tall. The rest of this thing was really dark. It might have been black or dark brown. My daughter saw the feet. They were huge. When I realized it might be a Bigfoot, I freaked out and tore out of there. I've never been down there after dark again. I rarely go there at all. It didn't move after the initial movement we saw. It just stood there looking at us. There are local legends about a wild man in the woods, and recently there have been a rash of sighting. Some of them are pretty close to town. The people who claim to have seen it are pretty believable, and their stories are quite convincing. I and my cousin were walking down Harris River from the Harris River campground. We were walking about 30 to 45 minutes when my cousin thought he saw something standing out in front of us about 100 or so feet away. When he asked me if I could see what it was, I told him I couldn't see because I don't have any contacts on or glasses. So he told me it was just a stump and I was like, okay. Then we went over to where we thought the thing was and in the sand about an inch deep, there was a footprint like a man's. In the shoe size, it looked like it might have been around the size 15. There were three footprints and about a minute later, we ran for about 10 minutes and we started walking and then we got to the road. About a mile away from the picnic area where we were having a Mother's Day picnic, we started to race each other to the picnic area where our family members were. We told them about it and we just kept it to ourselves for some odd reason. This incident happened around 11 p.m. at night. My daughter was home alone. She lives with a relative who was out of town. She calls me at 11.22. She was terrified. She said she could hear something walking back and forth by her bedroom window. She also said she looked out the window, and when she first heard it and saw something big and black, really big, she described the thing to have been about three to four feet above the bottom of the window. When I went down to look behind the house this morning, I stood by the window. I am 5'4", and my eyes just reached the bottom of the window, so I figure this thing must have been seven to eight feet tall. 
We live in a small village of less than 500 people. There are a lot of bushes and trees in between the houses. Their house is close to the beach, and there's forests surrounding the town. Now, I've never known my daughter to be afraid of anything, but last night when I went to pick her up, she was shaking like a leaf. She was hysterical. It took me almost an hour to calm her down. I questioned her about what happened. She called me about five minutes after she first saw it. She was too scared to move. When I got down there, I would not look behind the house, but she was hiding in my relative's closet. She said it was walking back and forth right behind the house. She described the footsteps as a sound that someone very large walking on two feet, kind of like a stomping. My daughter is very down to earth, not one prone to dramatics. When I first went down there, I didn't really know what was going on, just that my daughter was scared spitless, but I would not look behind the house. When I went up to the house, my hair felt like it was standing on end and I had goosebumps really bad. I was scared and I didn't know why. There are quite a few other stories about sightings close to town. One was less than a mile away, but there have also been other sightings on a nearby road by several people. In fact, there's probably too many for me to tell about. It was January of 2003 in Baxter County, Arkansas. It was around Highway 62 and the 101 intersection. It was around 2 or 3 in the morning and it was a cold, clear winter night. I was coming home from fishing as we rounded the 30 mile an hour curve right before the stop sign. We were headed south on 101 and an animal walking upright came into clear view as he was in my high beams and was on the west side shoulder. My buddy Joe, who was with me and I, said not a word to one another. We were now at maybe 20 miles an hour as we watched this big critter who was standing upright take one step and went from the far side of the shoulder to the center line, where he paused for a moment, looked us up and down, although we felt no fear from it, Joe and I each felt like he looked at each one of us, me first and then Joe, before turning his head straight. Then he leaned forward and put his knuckles on the pavement and swung his hips through his arms and was now on the far side of the east shoulder and was gone. I did not see anything. I did hear a lot though. And while in a boat fishing with two friends, we were along the shoreline joking around and trying to catch something when we heard a very large animal wrestling in the woods. The animal and object was not at all that far from us, but we could not see due to the dense vegetation and the low light conditions. The creature did sound to be very large and the thrashing of the vegetation became louder. The three of us in the boat did begin to speculate what we were hearing and none of us were worried until we heard the shrill from this animal. It can only be described as very loud, bone chilling, and in did fact strike fear in all of us. We begin to pull our lines and start the boat ASAP to leave the area, and the animal began to run away from our location. I think the direction was southeast, if I am correct. We still could hear the animal moving through the dense vegetation at a fast pace with no apparent problem. The animal continued to shrill on occasion, stopping approximately every 200 or so yards. The distance the final shrill was heard at was approximately one-fourth to half a mile away through dense woods and vegetation, up a hill. The time frame which this took place in was so fast we were unable to think of an animal which could sound so large and have such a deep shrill, and of course move so fast. The shrill was not as any other animal I have ever heard, nor was it the two other people I was with. The shrill was later heard by me, approximately two years later while on my way home from work. I was listening to Art Bell and Bigfoot was the topic, and somebody had an audio of a Bigfoot. When the audio was played, I again became afraid, speechless, and the hair on my neck stood up, and my eyes teared. When I was about 13 years old, I went trout fishing with my mother and aunt on the White River in Arkansas. We were staying at a motel in Bull Shoals. One morning, we drove to a remote area of the river to fish via an unknown dirt road. We stopped to fish a bend of the river. 
On the opposite side of the river, which was west, was a tall stone bluff with a slight overcrop from erosion. On the east side was flatter land with 12 to 20 foot thin scrub trees, about 20 to 30 feet from the water, as the river was low. While my mother and aunt were fishing off the bank, I decided to try my luck further up the river, about 300 yards away and just out of sight with my mother. While I was fishing along the bank, I began to hear rustling sounds in the trees and shrubs behind me. I looked in the direction of the noise and could see in the tops of these thin trees moving as if something were walking through them and pushing them to the side. But due to the thickness of the vegetation, I could not see what was actually moving the trees. I stood and observed this activity for two to three minutes. I began hearing grunting type sounds that were very deep and substantial sounding. These sounds were similar, but different than grunt sounds a bull would make. The movement of the trees began to appear as if something were shaking the trees at this point, instead of moving through them. It appeared that whatever was making the noises was only about 10 feet inside the brush, yet I could not see what it was. Feeling nervous, I decided whatever was in the brush moved with me, step for step. As I walked the movement in the trees, it seemed to be more forceful, with the sounds of large branches breaking as it moved. When I got within sight of my mom, which was about 50 yards, all activity stopped. I informed my mother there was something in the brush following me, but of course, she shrugged it off. Within a few moments, we decided to leave as we were not catching any fish. I was standing about 10 feet down in the forest, around a deep ravine, not really too far from the house, but it was right next to a patch of woods, going back further south into the national forest. The narrow patch of woods then stretched on northward. Leaves were on the ground. That was the first thing that impinged on my consciousness, the sound of something walking through leaves. It was a measured long tread, I could tell. I started really looking around, trying to see what was making those sounds. I was much braver back then. Then, over on the other side of the ravine, close to the bottom, but definitely walking uphill, I saw it. For all of about three seconds, seemed like longer at the time, and about 50 to 100 yards away, it was very large, and I could see that it was hairy. I could see the ground between its moving legs, and some vague image of arms, but not the head. Some forest branch obscured my view of the very top part of the body. I could tell it was walking upright, uphill. It was not a bear. It was standing with a purpose up on the hill on the other side. It was quickly out of sight. Now, I know I wasn't thinking clearly, because I decided I had to try to get a better look at it. So I ran as quickly as I could around the rim of the ravine. Since its origins began in our front yard, which is not the best playground, I can tell you. Anyway, it didn't take me long to reach the other side and move down to the woods slightly to look around and see if I can find it again. It did not see it again. I was there for only a minute or so when it suddenly occurred to me that I didn't hear anything anymore at all. No sounds, no birds, no nothing. And fear like I'd never known before hit me and I went running practically screaming back to the house. I told her what I'd seen and she of course did not believe me, my mother though she told me to never tell anyone else the story. For a long time, I didn't tell a soul, except family members, but of course, they didn't believe me. It didn't help that only one or two people since then truly believed that I saw a Bigfoot. Since then, I have had lots of trouble going out alone in the woods. While no one actually calls you a liar, they look skeptical, and you can tell they either think you've been drinking or drugging or saw a bear. In early to mid-October of 1981, I was 17 years old. I was working weekends in Fayetteville, a town 28 miles from where I lived in Siloam Springs. I usually left for work around 5.30 in the morning. I would drive the old Highway 68 towards Fayetteville, Springdale. One morning, I was on my way to work as I was coming close to where Fairmount Road was. I could see something by the bridge at first. I thought it was a coyote or a large dog scratching around the bridge with its back legs. As I got closer, 
I realized it was not, and that it was actually a Sasquatch. It was reddish brown in color, and I could see its face area had almost no hair, and the skin tone was lighter than the rest of it. It looked up at me as I passed on over the bridge. My car was a Volkswagen Bug, and the lights were not very bright. It seemed to be startled. I looked into the rearview mirror to see it jump up and run across the road. It moved in long strides and very quickly. It was tall, maybe close to seven feet, and was thinner than I would have expected it to be. The activity it seemed to be doing when I first saw it was digging at the ground next to the bridge. The motion it was using was similar to what primates do. The manner in which it moved across the road was, however, more like a human would move. Well, I live in Bentonville, Arkansas right now. My dad owned his own business. One day, we got on the subject I was telling him that I had bought a little book of ghost stories and Bigfoot sightings and how I was very, very interested in Bigfoot. Then he told me that he had seen Bigfoot before and told me the whole story. At first, I didn't believe him, but a couple of years later, he told me the same story when we got on the topic again. The story is that he was riding ATVs with his friends around or in either Lost Bridge Lake over Beaver Lake and he was at that front of the group of four-wheelers and they were going down this hill that led to a dirt road. Since he was in the front of the group, he went down first and got on the dirt road and stopped to wait for the rest of the group to come down. Before they came down, he looked over across the dirt road on the other side of the hill on the tree line where the evening sun was shining through the trees and seen the Bigfoot walking. He said it was taking really big steps and appeared to be around eight feet tall. He couldn't see the color because the sun was shining through the trees and Bigfoot, so you know it appeared as a shadow. Then the rest of the group came down and he told them what he saw and they did not believe him. That's all he told me. He told me he couldn't remember every detail, but he still knows more than me. I can't remember everything. The reason I'm telling you and not him is that I probably couldn't get him to tell you. I'm telling you this because I'm learning about Bigfoot in our biology class at Bentonville High School. My teacher is a marine biologist and a cryptozoologist. We watch the Bigfoot movie and the legend of Boggy Creek in class. In late November of 2000, my son and I were walking my terrier dog and looking for arrowheads along Beaver Lake. My dog began to follow a large and well-defined set of raccoon tracks along the lake shore. The shoreline was larger than usual due to the lack of rain. The morning was sunny with temperatures being about 50 degrees, sweatshirt weather. The raccoon tracks proceeded about 20 yards away from the water to an area of great disturbance in the packed sandy soil. Disturbance as in some type of scuffle. The raccoon tracks intersected with two sets of human-like footprints which had come from a nearby woodline. From the disturbance site, the human-type tracks returned to the woodline, but the raccoon tracks ceased to exist. We did not have a camera or tape measure, but one set of tracks were 16 to 17 inches long and about 5 to 6 inches across on the ball of the foot. The smaller set, which ran parallel to the larger, were about 11 inches in length and maybe 4 to 5 inches at the ball. The larger set were impressed in the soil about 4 inches and the smaller pair only a couple. These tracks were very flat in appearance as well. I weigh 130 pounds and my son 180. We left only faint impressions in the soil. We attempted to follow these tracks back the way they had come but we lost sight of them in the forest as the ground was much firmer and covered with leaves. One final note, my terrier dog was whining and acting very unusual, defecating and urinating on the disturbance site, then attempting to cover the location with sand and dirt. Late one night, my wife and I decided to go on a moonlit walk on our property to find good spots to look up at the stars because we were considering on getting a telescope. We got into the car and drove the very end of our driveway and parked. 
Our driveway is approximately a quarter of a mile of the main road with thick woods on both sides. We started walking up the driveway. About halfway up, we felt like we were being watched. So we stopped and we started hearing very loud noises in the woods to our left. It sounded like something was running towards us. Shocked and panicked, my wife turned and started running back towards the vehicle. My wife, Reba, said this. I wanted to get out there as fast as I could. I told my husband to come on, and he told me to go ahead. So I ran back to the car as fast as I could. I got into the car and locked the doors. Jason, the husband, continued the story. After my wife ran back to the vehicle, I immediately got a flashlight out of my pocket to scan the woods. I did not feel comfortable turning my back on whatever this was. I smelled a foul in the air. It is hard to describe this odor. The best way to describe it is an overwhelming, nauseating odor. It smelled like a mixture of roadkill and wet dog with a faint scent of sulfur. The best description of the sulfur smell is the smell after striking a match and blowing it out, but more potent. My heart was racing and my palms were sweaty. My senses were heightened and my body went into a state of alert from fear, which is not normal for me. I grew up my whole life hunting entering the woods, well before daylight and exiting the woods well after sundown. I know what deer sounds like running through the woods and I'm familiar with local wildlife like bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, panthers, wild hogs. I'm not easily scared. There's been times that I've had to leave the woods with nothing but the backlight of a cell phone. So I don't scare easily. But this animal kept charging at me a little bit at a time and then it would stop and charge again. It was so loud that it sounded like a bull elephant coming through the woods at me. This was when I knew it was something that I had never heard before. I never did get a glimpse of the creature, and I did not see any eye shine. I searched high and low, scanning the woods. The animal had to be far enough into the woods to where I could not see it, but it sounded like it was right next to me, in the edge of the woods. At this point, I slowly backed up the hill, never turned around, and never showed my back, and always kept the flashlight on scanning the woods. Not knowing what to expect, I built up enough courage to shout out, that's enough, just stay back, in a stern, loud voice. I doubt the creature understand anything I just said, but I was just hoping the tone I used would be enough to make it stop coming towards me. Then, shortly after I shouted, everything began to calm, and I think it understood that we were leaving the area. After feeling that I was being watched and pushed out of the area, I finally reached the top of the hill and felt it was safe to turn around so I ran the rest of the way to the car. My wife had the doors locked, so I flashed my light and tapped on the window. She immediately unlocked the doors, and I got in. Then she immediately locked the doors back, and we drove back up to the house. This was the first of many occurrences that happened on that property. It seemed that after this encounter, the activity picked up in the following months. I have heard many stories at deer camp about people seeing this creature, but I always dismissed it as folklore. But this experience made me realize that there is really something out there. This made me have the desire to look into it further and to do some of my own research because I felt as if I were losing it. As I replay the events in my head, I try to make sense of it all, but the research I have done seems to bring me more questions than answers. On December 4th, 2005, at approximately 8.15 a.m., I was standing approximately 50 yards from the southwest corner boundary marker of my property when I heard the neighbor's dog start to bark and run southward toward Arkansas Highway 7. They only ran a short distance before stopping. I immediately thought that they must be barking at a deer that was crossing the road. My first thought was to get my gun from my truck. Then I remembered that I had parked outside the fence in front of my house. So, I decided to just stand there and see if it was a doe or a buck and hope it would not feel pressured since the dogs had stopped barking. I also believed the deer would just change directions if it saw me hurrying in its same general direction. Therefore, I just stood still and waited in hopes of getting a glimpse of it. Then, if the dogs would keep quiet, I could hunt it later. 
Only one got to see it for two to three seconds, but I saw it clearly. My first impression was that I was observing a very large man who was wearing a hooded black parka. Then I realized it was some kind of animal. It was approximately 50 yards away and was on the opposite side of an old fence that had been overtaken by grass, weeds, and vines. I only had a left side view of it as it was traveling east along an old fence row. It covered a distance of about 20 yards in just three seconds. I could only see its upper body. I could see that it was not a bear, but I couldn't make out distinct facial features from the side from that distance. It was like an ape in some ways, but its posture appeared more manlike. I can best describe the size by comparing it to a very large man I know who is approximately six foot nine and weighs 280. This creature was at least that tall, possibly a little taller, but close to that same build. I did not get a long view of it. I probably would not have had the time to take a picture, even if I would have had a camera on my hand. It was moving at a very brisk pace, but not lightning fast. Its stride resembled a trot or even a jog. The body was moving quickly, but there was no up and down motion. It appeared to have a moderately thick coat of black hair. From what I could tell, its face was dark too, as if there was some hair on the face. It was moving through a well-used deer crossing. There's an old fence row there, on of both sides of Arkansas Highway 7. The west fence row had recently been cleared and the east side was logged about five years ago and has a fair amount of undergrowth and a game trail running along the south side of the fence row. Just a little to the southwest of the spot, there is a thicket that is approximately three acres in size. There are a couple partial open areas in the woods there. Most parts of this thicket can be walked through fairly easily. In places, the thicket is too thick to move through without clippers and or a machete. I did not see where the creature crossed Arkansas Highway 7, but it most likely came from an area that is about 40 yards away from the highway's west side right-of-way. I believe that this creature waited until there were no cars coming before crossing the road. I did not get the impression that it was running from something. I have mentally replayed the entire scenario many times and I have stood and looked at the same area where the creature was seen. I looked for tracks after the incident but the ground was too brushy for obvious tracks. I have stood in the spot where I observed the creature from. I have watched as vehicles travel north along Arkansas Highway 7 and considered every other possible scenario. It wasn't any kind of illusion. I was there and I saw it. Wednesday, October 12th, 2005. Our neighbor's dog were very active and barking all night. The next morning about 5.30 a.m., my own dog was barking in the backyard. I opened the door to calm her down and I heard something in the back of our property near the fruit trees. It was very heavy sounding and I could hear branches breaking as it departed. The next morning around 8.30, my husband went to his truck in the backyard and heard something behind our shop take off running. He thought it was a hunter and ran to the back to listen. He thought it sounded like it was on two feet. He said it stomped very heavily as it was running through the woods and he could hear snorting. Sunday, October 16th, I went walking around the neighborhood road and discovered several sets of large and small bare footprints on the gray slate road in front of our house. At first, I thought it was a child's footprint until I looked closer. There were two sets. The largest measured 13 and a half by seven inches and the small print measured nine by four inches. I took pictures of all the prints and measured each one. They consistently measured the same size. The large print is about three inches wider than my husband's foot and he's a rather big man. Several friends and myself had gone together to purchase 120 acres of cutover forest land that was totally surrounded by several thousand acres of timber company land. This land was at the end of a small valley and at the far end of a dead end road. On my portion of the land was a small rise in the northern half of the valley and I was working on building a shack to be used for hunting and camping. 
One night, about 8 p.m., while working inside by lantern light, I decided to step outside on the deck for a cigarette. As soon as I lit my lighter, a roaring, crackling scream commenced from the slope of the ridge to the south, about 300 yards away, but in direct line of sight. I was too startled to do anything but stay rooted to the spot and feel the hair stand up on the back of my neck, something which hasn't happened to me in years. While the scream lasted for only a couple of seconds, it seemed to go on for very, very long. Since it was very cloudy and dark, I ran inside for a flashlight, all the while wishing I had brought my rifle inside from the truck. With a flashlight and a hatchet, I headed for the truck only to find that the truck itself seemed to be moving. In the bed of the truck, I found my German Shepherd. I had forgotten all about him curled in a tight ball in the corner and shaking so hard he was moving the whole truck. We left immediately. Several nights later, one of the friends who had laughed at me when I told the story came out to see how I was progressing with the shack. He laughed more at the extra lanterns I had placed inside and outside, and at the pistol and shotgun I had laying on the table. We stepped out onto the lit deck and almost immediately the same grating scream came at exactly the same spot on the south ridge. In a flash, my friend was standing back to back with me as we stared out into the dark. Since the dog was not with us, and because we were armed and had good flashlights, we stayed there for about two more hours, but heard nothing else. But I was certainly glad to have a witness this time. Several weeks later, my friend and I ran into one of the other property owners and were relating the story to him when I noticed him becoming a bit pale. He finally told us that he had been burning piles of deadfall on his part of the property, that butts into the south ridge, and was walking back and forth to the stream to get water, to put out several of the fires when he heard something walking around him in the woods. It was too dark to see, but he at first assumed it was a deer, or maybe a bear. After he had listened for a while, he decided it sounded like a two-legged creature and believed it was one of us trying to play a joke on him. So, he continued putting out his fires while listening to whatever it was make a circle around him. But when it got upwind from him, he began to smell a terrible odor that he admitted scared him so badly that he got in his truck and left, ignoring his still smoldering fires. I cannot say what it was that we heard or what the other man had smelt, but I have heard several kinds of big cats, bears, howler monkeys, and other large animals in my years hunting and in the army, and I have never heard anything that sounded remotely like what was heard those two nights. My children and I were driving back from my mother's home in Cushman, Arkansas, on Thanksgiving Day, around 10 p.m. We were approaching Newark on Highway 65 South, just outside, Macedonia Road turns off the highway to the left. We had to stop for traffic as we came up on that road. There were two cars in front of us. The one in front was waiting to turn left onto the road. There were three cars in oncoming traffic and one car on the road waiting to turn left onto Highway 65 toward Newark. As our truck slowed due to the stopped traffic ahead of us, I saw something very dark in a crouched position behind the car directly in front of us. As the vehicle started to move, the figure stood and stepped all in one motion off the side of the highway. It was on two legs and taller than the cab of our full-size pickup. In the crouched position, it was taller than the hood of my truck. You could see the profile of a head, shoulders, back, buttocks, legs, and arms swinging wide. I was speechless. My daughter, 11 at the time, also saw the figure and said, Did you see that? As she locked her door, I was a major skeptic until this. It really left me scratching my head. I had heard stories of sightings around here, but never believed any of them until now. It was about July 5th, 2015. It was late, about 3.30 a.m. I had fallen asleep on my cousin's sofa, about 10 p.m. after a long day at our family reunion. All of a sudden, the dog started going crazy. 
It woke me up, so I kind of lay there, thinking to myself, I wish they would shut up. Then, all of a sudden, I heard one of the dogs yell out like it was hurt. Then, I heard the sound of something coming up on the front porch, so I sat up to look out the front window. It just so happens that we left the porch light on, and what I saw was unforgettable and unbelievable. It was squatting down right in front of me. I guess it was too big to stand straight up on the porch. I don't know why it was there, but we had left the empty beer and soda cans and leftover food scraps and a couple of trash bags to be thrown out the next day. But to make a long story short, I was no more than eight to 10 feet away from it. I looked at it for what seemed like an hour, but I never actually saw its face because its back was to me the whole time and I never leave my 45 caliber. But for some reason, I did not have it with me this time. If I had, you would have had a corpse to show the world, but this thing has become aggressive in this area of Alabama where my family lives. July 8th, it kills my cousin's bulldog. In May, it chases another family member. In June, it looks into a family member's window in broad open daytime. So I'm trying to get some of the guys together and try and kill it because no one will do anything to research and capture this thing. We know where it lives and how it travels. All we want is for somebody to capture it and remove it. I live in Texas, but my family resides in Alabama, and they are living in fear of this thing, so it has to go one way or another. When my aunt was about 11 or 12 years old, she was helping her older cousin Jerry in the field at her aunt's house in an area they called Screamer in Henry County, Alabama. It was a hot day and after some time, Jerry grew very thirsty and asked my aunt to walk up the road to the house and get him a glass of water. My aunt then walked through the field back toward the dirt road leading to her aunt's house. Upon reaching the dirt road, she saw two creatures standing on the other side of the road. She stopped and began slowly backing up and then stopped again. She stood there looking at them and they looking at her for about a minute or so, long enough for her to get a good look at them. They were only around 10 feet away from her at that point. She on one side of the dirt road and they on the other. She described them as standing next to each other. One was, in her estimation, around five feet tall and the other was slightly shorter, around four feet tall. She said that she got the impression they were young. She said that they were really hairy and completely covered in dark brownish black hair, that they looked sort of like gorillas but with human looking faces with hair on them, human looking hands and human looking feet. She said their noses were free of hair and that the color of their noses was dark, brown or black as were their feet and hands. They stood very still other than blinking just looking at her Except for being covered in thick hair, their faces looked human with regular human looking noses. After a minute or so, she took off running as fast as she could back up to the house to get water Jerry had requested. She did not look back as she ran. She got the water and proceeded to walk back toward the field. The creatures were not there anymore. She never told anybody about this incident until just a couple of months ago because she was always afraid people would make fun of her. This would have been in summer of 1953, with the nearest road being Highway 95. It was a few days after Hurricane Frederick. I was 11 years old at the time. We lived in a trailer on Hurricane Road, and my grandparents owned the Hurricane Landing and Fish Camp, what is now Perkins Landing. We were left without power after the hurricane, so all of our food was on ice. It was about 11 p.m. and my dad asked me to walk to my grandparents' store and get some ice. So I grabbed a flashlight and took off walking. It was less than a quarter of a mile from our house to the store, and I was already very used to walking the route on a daily basis. So I'm walking down the left side of the road, and I could hear the dogs barking and really cutting up. They belonged to an older man who lived in a little white house down the road on the right. He kept them in a pen behind his house, so when I get in the front of the house, I shine my light across the street, at and around the house. Suddenly, I see something very large run from behind the house on two legs. 
I followed it with my light as it ran towards the woods, and then it stopped and turned and looked at me. Its eyes glowed red in the dark, and all of a sudden, it runs straight at me. It was so fast. I mean, it traveled probably about 30 or 40 yards in just a flash, and then it stopped right at the edge of the road. I was scared frozen. I couldn't scream or run, and we just stood there for what seemed like an eternity, but in all actuality was probably just a second or two. Then suddenly, it let out a high-pitched growling sound, and then I screamed, and it turned and ran, and I ran all the way home. When I got home, I was so upset that I could hardly breathe or talk. My parents finally calmed me down, and I told them what happened, but they didn't believe me. The next day, my dad and my uncle went down there to look for tracks, but they didn't find any. My uncle told me I probably saw a bear, but even I know a bear can't run on two legs. The creature I saw was extremely large. I would have to say now that it was at least seven feet tall, very broad shoulders covered from head to toe in dark brown to black hair. His mouth and large, square teeth kind of stuck out from the rest of the face, and the eyes were sunk in. As a veteran, I can tell you that I've never been so scared in my life. I have been reluctant to share my story because of my field of work and do not want to have people think I'm crazy as this could severely damage my career. But as I get older, I feel this incident needs to be documented. The incident occurred in the winter of 1980, just a few miles east of Clayton, Alabama, in Barber County. I was traveling with my aunt, grandmother, and four younger cousins to a relative's house. It was dark and probably around 9 p.m. from the best that I can remember. For some reason though, my aunt needed to turn around and proceeded to pull off the roadway by a small clearing. I was in the front seat of the car with my aunt, who was driving, and my grandmother. As we turned off the road, the headlights caught a figure in mid-stride. It then immediately froze and did not move anymore. It was about 30 yards away from the car, very close. I could see the entire side view of this creature, and its body was slightly turned so that it was looking at us. The most terrifying thing in my memory is this thing's huge eyes glaring at us. The best way I can describe the creature's expression is stunned. The face was covered in hair except for around the eyes. The hair was dark and appeared longer and wavy looking on the arms and legs. It was very tall and massive, but yet also lean looking. I would say it was easily over seven feet tall, if not more. When it froze in the headlights, one arm was slightly extended behind the creature, and it held this position. At this point, my grandmother was crying and begging for my aunt to drive away. Two of my younger cousins were huddled on the floorboard in the back seat crying. I was terrified but could not look away. My aunt kept telling my grandmother, there is no way he can get in this car, and she kept the car still and we watched this motionless creature for about two to three minutes. It was almost completely motionless. It was as if the creature thought we could not see him if he did not move. I don't know how it stood so still. The hair on my neck is standing on end as I type this. It scared me terribly. He kept staring at us with those eyes stretched very wide open. I'll never forget that look he gave us. Finally, my aunt decided to flash the lights on and off real quick. The instant that she did this, the creature jumped toward the woods and was gone. He was about 10 yards from the woods, but made it there in less than a second. I can't believe how fast this huge creature could move. The event itself traumatized me. I have never been able to go into the woods alone or enjoy camping since this event. I tried to deer hunt, but could not enjoy it and quit. I cannot sit alone in a tree stand without thinking of this creature and becoming tense. I can't imagine coming upon this thing alone in the wilderness. I know these creatures exist. There is no doubt in my mind. I saw one up close and personal. We never saw the creature again. My grandmother says that she and my late grandfather saw a strange creature near their home in the early 1950s. This home is located about four miles from my original 1980 sighting. 
she and my grandfather went out on the front porch late one night and saw a creature standing in the edge of the woods near the house. They could only see its chest and arms in the shadows. She said it was tall and hairy. My grandfather yelled at the creature and it ran back into the woods towards a stream and made a great deal of noise thrashing throughout the trees and brush. She said they did find some strange three-toed footprints the next day, but they never had another encounter with the creature after my incident. I was driving a VW bus, so I had a good view of my surroundings. As I rounded the first corner of the exit, I noticed what I thought was a big white dog, like an Afghan running on all fours towards the road, up on an embankment. We both reached the same point at the same time, and I thought I would hit the dog. It seemed it didn't notice my car until it reached the side of the road, when it was only feet away. I don't remember slowing much, but I wasn't going very fast to start with, as the curve was pretty tight. As the creature reached the road and I saw it, it stood up on its back legs. It was covered with long white hair, maybe eight inches long. It wasn't thick, but more stringy and dirty looking, and it had a round head, not a dog. I passed the creature and didn't catch it in my mirrors as it was dark. It scared me. I didn't get much detail of its face, but I did notice a fairly large mouth or lips which were very prominent. The head was not huge and the body was fairly slender. It was probably as tall as the VW when it stood up, well over six feet. On November 9th, 2008, a suspicious knocking was heard about 3 a.m. as my husband was camping with Boy Scouts on the side of a ridge southeast of Henderson Peak, about 200 yards from State Road 281. This is just south of the Chiaha State Park line. It was about 14 degrees with intermittent howling wind. There were three sets of two knocks each, about 100 yards north of the campsite described as a piece of firewood hitting another. It was very loud and the knocks, though themselves rhythmic, were spaced so that the wind died down before they occurred again. These were not little limbs hitting each other and he was not able to determine if there was any response because of the wind. There were no campers north of them and the only other campers on the mountain that were encountered was another Boy Scout troop camping about four miles away, directly on Lake Chinobi. My husband is an avid Bigfooter who awoke and immediately felt that this was consistent with other knocking activity. Due to the inclement conditions and not wanting to scare the younger kids in the camp, he did not have the chance to follow up. Although he didn't mention the sounds the next morning, another adult did, and with careful roundabout questioning, all other factors for the sounds were excluded, like trees falling, wind, limbs hitting each other due to the wind, etc. I am typing this since he was not sure of the cause of the sound and was reluctant to report something that may not have been genuine. There are other reports of activity in the Talladega areas and we know of one other not reported in Perry County. This particular sighting happened in July of 2007 and was about a one hour drive, shorter as the crow flies, from this incident. My husband also observed suspicious activity as a youth. 12 to 14 while hiking with his uncle somewhere in the vicinity of the Vincent County in the form of a huge noise about 40 yards from them as they stood in a creek and upon climbing out observed twisted branches about two inches thick and uprooted bushes which was taken as the huge sound they heard. He was not interested nor had knowledge of Bigfoot at the time. It affected them so much though immediately and they left the area. About seven years ago, my wife and I were at a lake in the middle of the Talladega National Forest in Alabama. The lake was Sweetwater Lake. We were fishing in a small boat at the end of a slough early in the morning. We were the only ones at the lake. I think it was on a Wednesday and we were all alone. We heard something scream. It started out as a howl and turned into a long high-pitched scream and it was so loud that it echoed through the mountains. It made the hair stand up on the back of our necks. But that is not all. About a year before that, my stepfather and I were hiking around the same lake. We liked to fish a spillway on the back side of the lake, 
About half a mile into the hike, we crossed a fire break about 20 feet wide. Now keep in mind that we are pretty good, way back in the woods. We have crossed rocks, thorns, and briars, and all kind of rough ground. And right there across the dried mud in the fire break is a set of footprints dried into the mud. They were not huge, they were about the size of a full grown man, but they didn't look human. I just couldn't understand why a man would be this far back in the woods without shoes on. And over the years, there is one thing I have thought about a Bigfoot would have to grow up. So maybe it was a juvenile. At the end of January 2013, I was traveling north on Alabama Highway 51 in northern Coffee County in a rural area approximately one mile south of the Dale County line just before dark. I estimate the time to be around 5 p.m. As I approached a left curve, I noticed a large dark mass in the roadway. At this point, I was within 100 yards of it. Suddenly, it moved to my right, and in about three steps, it was on the shoulder of the road facing me. It was a bipedal creature, approximately nine feet tall with a shoulder span approaching four feet with the most intense yellow-green eyes that I've ever seen, spaced around six to eight inches apart. In my headlights, I could see it was covered in gray-brown hair. The face was ape-like with dark brown, black, leathery skin. This creature lifted its left arm, possibly to shield its eyes or perhaps anticipating being hit, as I was about 30 feet from it. Then I was past it. It took several seconds for the significance of what had occurred to sink in. In 1979 and 1980, I was living in my grandparents' old home place on our family farm in Alabama. The farm was about 300 acres of woods, covering an area of deep hollows leading down to sloughs off a river. In late summer and fall of 79, we had been having trouble with deer poachers and some cattle rustling on our farm. So I was spending a lot of time out at night and on my off days trying to catch them. Several times at night and a couple of times during the day, I had heard strange screams back in the woods towards the river. The first time I heard them, I thought it might be a peacock or a screech owl, but it really didn't sound like either and it seemed to be much louder and much more prolonged. I really didn't think much of it until one night I was walking back to the house from the back of the farm at about 11 p.m. It was a clear night with a bright half moon shining and I could see quite well. I was skirting along the south edge of the woods, about a half mile due north of the house, when suddenly I got a creepy feeling that I was being watched and or was in danger. My skin started crawling and the hair on the back of my neck and hands stood up. At the same time my dog, a large Doberman pincher, started acting nervous and whining quietly and started looking back over his shoulder to our left towards the wood line. I eased the safety off my rifle and increased my pace. Right at that instant, something screamed right in the edge of the woods less than 35 yards behind and to the left of us. The pitch and volume of the scream was incredible. I could feel my chest vibrating from the loudness of the scream. My dog and I both broke and I ran to our right into the pasture, about 50 yards, and I spun around and stopped with my rifle up to see if it was chasing us, but it wasn't. I stood there with my rifle up, and whatever it was screamed at us five or six more times. Also, I could hear movement in the dry leaves where the sound was coming from. It sounded like a large person pacing back and forth. I could also see the tops of some saplings and the small trees sway and move as it bumped into them or pushed and pulled on them. The screams were longer lasting and a little lower pitched than what I had heard before. I also know for sure that they weren't bobcat screams. I became aware of the sound of our cattle running away towards the southwest. The woods got quiet, but I knew it was standing there, still watching me, but I never saw anything. I backed away for about a hundred yards and then broke into a jog back to the house, spinning around and stopping with my rifle up and about every 50 yards or so, just to make sure it wasn't following me. A few nights go by. I was up late, 1.30 a.m. and getting ready for bed. I came out of the bathroom into my bedroom 
and my dog was standing there, staring towards the front of the house. He was completely stiff, with the hair standing up on the back and the neck, and he was growling very low and menacingly. It was the only time I have ever seen him do that, and he was deadly serious. I got a glimpse of a shadow move across the corner of my front bedroom window, moving towards the west side of the house. The moon was shining right on the west wall of the house. My dog turned towards the west and kept growling even more seriously. Then I saw a large, sort of human-shaped shadow move across both windows on the west side of the house. The dog kept turning and growling and following the shadow. Whatever it was, had to have been about 10 feet tall to cast a shadow that far up on the windows. I was petrified with fear. I finally picked up my riot shotgun and chambered a round of buckshot. My dog at this time was staring towards the north window of the spare bedroom and was still stiff but not growling quite as bad. I got up enough nerve to look out the bathroom window but saw nothing. My yard was surrounded by a three foot high hog wire fence with two strands of barbed wire on top and locked steel gates. So whatever it was stepped over the fence to get into and out of my yard. The gates made a lot of noise if you tried to climb or open them, so it did not come or go through the gates. In the following weeks, while I was walking through the woods near the river, in two different locations, I found several deer that had been killed. At the time, I thought poachers had done it, but they were all complete except for having their abdomens cut torn open and the guts pulled out. None of the meat was gone from any of them, other than what possums or coons had eaten, and most of them had broken legs. Only one was a buck, and it was a yearling spike. One of the deer had been killed right where I found it. There were broken limbs and saplings and hair all around it. There were tufts of deer hair hung in the bark of two larger trees next to the carcass. Some of the tufts were over 10 feet off the ground. Both of the deer's back legs were broken and twisted. Even then, I thought that it looked like something had grabbed that deer by the back legs and beaten it to death against the tree. I didn't tell anybody about any of this. My dad and other folks had told me that people had been hearing and seeing strange things along that part of the river for decades. But I had a neighbor that had told about seeing a Bigfoot on his property just a few years earlier and everybody laughed at him. In the early fall of 1980, my wife was bringing in the wash one night, about 7 p.m. I had fed the horses some oats about 30 minutes earlier, and I was now in the kitchen, and suddenly I heard a scream outside. I ran out and my wife was running in, scared nearly to death. Something was right outside the gate between the storage shed and the tack room, screaming just like before. The horses went running out there, wide open, the fence and gate there is quite high because there is a corral there also. I could hear it moving around but only get a glimpse of it occasionally. It was much taller than the six foot fence there and it appeared to be black with maybe a little silver or gray mixed in. There's a street light in our yard on that side of the house and when it moved under through a patch of light, I could see the light glint off its fur. It was tall enough that it hit or shoved aside some tree limbs that I had to jump to be able to touch. It screamed several more times, and I could tell that it was becoming more and more agitated. Between screams, I could hear it making a very eerie, strange noise with an intermittent clicking sound that sounded like it was growling as it chewed or moved its mouth. I ran back to the house and locked all my doors. We moved shortly after that, and I spent hardly any time on the farm until we moved back to the area in 1997. My son, daughter, and I, and a couple of two friends were coon hunting on the back of the farm near the river last year, which would have been November 1999. And the dogs were down on the east side of the ridge, and we were waiting up on the top of the ridge for them to tree. We started to hear the same screams as before, 600 yards to the west of us, in one of the areas where I had found a dead deer before. The screams lasted maybe 30 seconds to a minute and then came to a stop. We had tried to get the dogs to go in that direction earlier and they wouldn't and we tried again but they kept circling back around and going to the truck and these are championship dogs. I didn't get to go back in the woods there until April of this year which is 2000. 
I found fresh deer bones in the area where I had found several dead deer 20 years before. Well, me and my cousin were deep in the woods, deer hunting, close to our little campsite, when we heard some very loud popping sounds, maybe 35 yards away. We froze, tried to figure out the sound, but couldn't. We started walking. It was getting late, almost dark, when we started to smell something. It smelt awful, deader than dead. My cousin hears something walking heavy. We turn around to look down the logging road and sees this thing step out of the tree line. It was a good 40 to 45 yards away and had dark brown hair, walked on two legs, and was nearly 9 to 10 feet tall. The thing just stood there. Out of being so scared, we couldn't move either. I couldn't have shot it if I wanted to, but we stared at each other for about 3 or 4 minutes when it took a step into the woods. We ran. First time ever seeing anything like that. I told some people, but they laughed and asked me how much I had been drinking. But I don't drink, so I saw the sight and decided to get this off my chest. I've been holding on to this for years, and I haven't been deer hunting that far into the woods since then. This was around Highway 72, off of Baker Lane. I was deer hunting in Freedom Hills Management Area, around Coon Dog Cemetery. I entered the woods before daylight and walked down the access road next to a pine forest. I came to the back of some pines where they had turned into heavy hardwoods. I sat down at the bottom of a tree and waited for daylight. During my way up, behind me on top of the ridge, I hear a series of grunting and heavy movement through the woods, walking down the ridge behind and down the ridge it went. Once daylight came, I walked up to where I first heard the grunting and movement. As I got to the area, I found bedding and hair. The hair I found I kept as a sample, and it wasn't wild hog or bear, nor mountain lion. This whole incident scared me and made me very uneasy. Later that night we heard wood knocks and had a tree pushed down. At approximately 1.30 in the morning on a night in February 2000, the witness and a friend were planning to visit a girl who lived close to the sighting location. They were riding together on a motorcycle and knew they would not be able to ride up to the girl's house without altering her mother of their presence. They decided to hide the bike on the side of a dirt road and walk to the house from there. Very shortly thereafter, they began to hear what the witness described as a very heavy walking, stomping noise. The witness described these sounds as similar to one, an extremely large person walking, or two, like a horse galloping, but only on two legs, coming from a swampy area which was only northeast of their location. They squatted in the bushes and listened for a couple of moments, at which time they determined the noise was getting closer to them and increasing in pace. At this time, they decided to make a break for the motorcycle and vacate the area. The friend of the witness was in the lead and caused a branch to swing back, hitting the witness in the head, knocking him down and damn near knocking him out. He got back up and began running after his friend, all the while hearing the sounds of stomping and crashing of underbrush, getting closer and closer to them. When he reached the spot where the motorcycle had been stashed, his friend was already pushing it out towards the road. He commented that, at this time, he could also hear heavy breathing which seemed to coincide with each footfall. Once they had the bike on the road, they both jumped on and his friend managed to kick start it and take off. The witness stated that he looked back just in time to see a very large creature leap from the edge of the woods out onto the road. I later measured this distance and it was around 12 feet to 15 foot. He said it hit the road on all fours and then stood fully erect. He did comment that when the creature landed on the road, it let out an audible grunt he could hear even above the noise of the motorcycle. He said the moon was full or near full and it was already in the western sky, causing the creature to stand in its own shadow. Since the creature was silhouetted, he was unable to make out any such details like facial features. However, he did emphasize to me that what he saw was not a bear as he's seen bears before and they were much more narrow than what he saw. 
He also emphasized this by hunching his arms forward and dropping his shoulders to indicate how a bear would stand, and then standing fully erect with his arms out from his sides in the stance that he said he observed the creature to be in. He said this creature was very wide and had fluffy-like hair, which covered it entirely. He was unable to see any fingers on the hands, although he did state from what he could tell, the hands appeared to be clenched and that the arms were no longer than a human's. He also said that from what he could see, the creature appeared to be a dark brown or black color. When asked about the height of the animal, he said it was at least six to seven feet tall. After thinking for a moment, he stated that his father is 6'4", and that this thing was bigger than his dad, making it closer to 7 feet in height total. It was a Sunday afternoon in late June of 2016. I was camped in a developed USFS campground on the Coconino National Forest in central Arizona in the Mogollon Rim area. The CG is situated in a canyon within a mixed forest of spruce, fir, oak, aspen, and other sort of pine. The cliff edge of the rim is about a three-fourths of a mile south of the CG. I was sitting in the shade and had just finished reading a work of fiction by James Patterson, which had a very strange ending. I was musing about the ending and just looking west across the CG, when a very fast-moving dark figure crossed the CG heading from north to south. My first thought of a large kid on a bicycle as it was moving so fast in the camp gravel road, but its travel path was counter to the road. Then I realized what it was that I had seen. It was a very large Bigfoot. The sighting only lasted about three seconds and I was very lucky to have seen it at all. It crossed the CG in a shaded area and blended very well into its background but the meadow beyond it to the west was bathed in afternoon sunlight and backlit the dark figure. It was about 125 yards from my viewpoint, so the facial detail was not clear. It ran with a slight forward cant to its body. I noted that the head did not bob up and down like a human runner's head at speed. The coat was almost black looking, but with the back lighting, I noticed a slight reddish tint to the figure's profile as it passed by. I had not noticed its legs or arm movement. Later, I went over to where the figure had crossed. On the north side of the drainage area, there was an area of crushed grass near the beginning of the travel path. Then the figure had moved south across the in-camp road and had gone into a depression in the high grass. There were other areas of crushed grass along its suspected travel route. Also, a crushed fern near the split rail fence that bordered the CG where I suspected had stepped over, crossed the forest road, and went into the thick timber. I believe the earth's depression and a row of large logs obscured my view of its legs as it passed by. I had only seen its torso from the hips up, but did note the figure did not appear to have much of a neck, if any. The torso was very thick, and I guessed it was at least twice the thickness of a human. It was a once-in-a-lifetime event, as I said, I was very lucky to have seen this Sasquatch at all. Truly an awesome event which I will carry in my mind's eye forever. It was a Sunday afternoon and I went to stay at a cabin we rented with my beautiful two children for the night. We were escaping the heat of Phoenix and it was a beautiful day, clear, sunny, and no rain or clouds. That night, we were asleep in the cabin, but I kept waking up because I was on a very uncomfortable cot. As I lay there, trying to fall asleep again, I heard what sounded like a whoop. This was followed by a clear wood knock sound. They were about 8 to 10 seconds apart. I lay there listening, and about one minute later, I heard the same whoop and again, followed up by another knock about 10 seconds later. They seemed to both come from the same direction, which was southeast of the cabin. I was the only one who heard it as the kids were asleep, and I didn't tell them as I didn't want to spook them. The sounds sounded close, I'm guessing within 50 yards since I was able to hear them while inside the cabin. There are a few other things that make this significant and eerie. One was that the time we arrived at the cabin, there was no wildlife or sounds. 
just birds chirping and the occasional wind blowing through the pine trees. We never heard a crack in the woods or any other wildlife sound. It was just quiet. So when I heard this, it stood out because we all heard nothing all afternoon, evening and night. Another is that we drove down the road to the cabin. We only saw two to three other camping parties along the roughly 12 mile stretch to get to the cabin. It was a Sunday afternoon, about 2 p.m. when we drove to the cabin. But when we left the next morning, about 7 a.m., they had all left. Assumingly, the previous afternoon since it was a Sunday. So we were the only ones in the area of 12 miles back in the woods. We passed one truck near the main road as we left Monday morning, but that was it. Lastly, was another noise we heard that I didn't put much credence into until after I heard the whoops. It was about 10.30 earlier that night, shortly after we climbed in bed. I was trying to fall asleep while the two kids were playing games on their iPods. All of a sudden, a rap noise hit the window on the south side of the cabin. Immediately, the kids look at me and say, what was that? The sound was like a small pebble hitting the window. Again, it was clear and visibly no wind. I played it off to the kids that it was probably just a moth or bug hitting the window, and it may have been just that. But then I heard the whoops and knocks later in the night and wondered if something was watching us. Whenever we camp, we always set up a camera trap for the fun of it, just to see what wonders in the camp. I did so on this night too, and it was set up in front of the cabin, but it had zero hits on it. Not sure to what all this adds up to. The thing hitting the window could have just been a bug, but the whoops and the knocks I have no explanation for, and I clearly did hear them. While in Flagstaff, Arizona, my husband, mother-in-law, and I decided to take a chairlift ride. As we drove up Snow Bowl Road to reach the Arizona Snow Bowl, we saw a large tall figure walking in long strides through the trees. I would say about 40 yards from the desolate road. As an avid finding Bigfoot watcher, our sighting was everything we heard and saw on the show. The Squatch had to have been at least 8 to 9 feet tall. It was too far away to make out any features, but the way it walked, the posture, and the dark brown black color, it was unmistakable. Definitely not a bear or deer. We saw the creature take two long strides through the trees and disappear. A feeling came over us of shock, fear, and amazement. I had goosebumps all over my body. We were camping out with a couple of my cousins along with their kids on 4th of July weekend at Wheatfields Lake, east side of the lake. We got there on Friday evening, which is July 3rd. We decided to camp there since there were lots of campers at the main campground, which is located on the west side of the lake, right off the highway. At 4 a.m. Saturday morning, my little boy woke and I started to tend to him. At 4.15, my girlfriend and I were sitting up inside the tent, feeding my little boy when we heard a loud, low-sounding roar coming near the west side of the campground. Immediately, some of the camper's dogs started to bark like crazy. I asked my girlfriend, Did you hear that? She replied, yes, what is it? It sounds scary. I told her that it's something huge with a good set of lungs. We heard it about five to six times. Duration of the calls would last like 10 seconds long. About five minutes later, the call ceased, but we could still hear the dogs barking away. Then, at 4.45 a.m., we heard one more call from the same location. Afterwards, my girlfriend and my little boy went back to sleep while I stayed awake all morning. The next morning, I asked my cousins if they had heard the calls, and they said they didn't. On February 1st, 2007, I took my husband to Show Low, Arizona to drop him off for 10 days with friends. The weather had been bad that day and progressively worsened so that I did not take my normal route back to New Mexico, which is through the White Mountain Apache Res. I went down the US Highway 60. It runs between Sholo and Springerville, Arizona, past a small town called Vernon, 
The terrain loses almost all of the juniper trees and is mostly rolling grassy hills. I have learned a type of defensive driving in elk country, wherein you keep alert to the peripheral vision movement. Something drew my attention to the left-hand side of the road, and I applied my brake, anticipating an animal, like an elk, deer, pronghorn, etc. What I saw made me turn and pay attention. It was bipedal and running dead at the road. I slowed as fast as possible and watched in open-mouthed awe as the creature placed one hand on the T-post, which is a metal pole used in barbed wire fencing, and vaulted over the fence, slowing very little and continued running. It crossed the road, which was a two-lane blacktop, in maybe two full strides and kept going into a narrow canyon far beyond my sight. I pulled to the side of the road and called my husband. He could not believe what I was saying. He finally asked me to get out of the car and look for tracks or hair or solid evidence. In very unladylike words, I told him no. I was alone, unarmed, and unwilling to meet something that big on a road that I had seen fewer cars in two hours than I had fingers on my hands. The creature was dark brown and had longish hair. I never saw its face full on. It had to be close to seven feet tall or more. It never seemed to be afraid or running dead out, more like a lope or a steady jog. The weather was cold and heavily cloudy, mix of precipitation, off and on all day. No standing snow. I'm a chiropractor. One afternoon, a few weeks back, I was on my way from Sholo, Arizona, to a ranch past Concho, Arizona, to work with a horse. I'm a certified in animal skeletal adjustment, which is chiropractic for animals. Between the Y and the highway and Concho, about six miles outside of Concho, at about 2.30 p.m., on a clear sunny day, I saw something come up onto the road, about half a mile in front of me. At first, I thought it might be a very large dog as it initially was coming up onto the road. But as it entered the highway, I could see that it stood straight up to a height about as tall as a road sign, maybe six or seven feet. It had long, dark brown hair from top to bottom and stood absolutely straight up. No slouch, no forward bending at all. It ran across the road from my right toward my left and remained fully standing as it ran off into the brush. The full incident took maybe 10 seconds. The area I live in is plentiful with big animals, elk, deer, bear, big cats, and much more. Many of my patients come to see me for injuries after auto encounters with these big animals. I've had some very close calls myself. During the 12 and a half years I've lived here, I've seen several animals I have never seen in the wild before. My far vision is incredibly good. It is my habit to drive hypervigilant for animals here. I'm quite familiar with bear movements since they are pretty well a nuisance to locals and spotted often here. It's the only other local animal that could have possibly fit the description as far as fur, color, and standing height. However, bears do not stand straight up to run across the road. In fact, they don't stand straight up at all. When they stand, they sort of hunch and hang their paws. This did no such thing. Immediately, I was very confused because I thought it looked like how a Sasquatch is described, but I didn't believe there might be any such thing as a Sasquatch in Bigfoot, in Arizona of all places. The Pacific Northwest? Maybe. But Arizona? It was beyond my conception. Since then, my wife and I have been looking for information on the web and have discovered that there have been sightings in this area for years by the White Mountain Apaches, who are generally pretty closed-mouthed about it. In retrospect, I realized I should have stopped and searched for tangible evidence, but I had an appointment and didn't want to be late. I'm fully convinced of what I saw and confident in my observation capacities. Myself and a friend were hunting this waterhole where deer and elk come to drink. The location is approximately seven miles north of a small community of Sawmill, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation. It was during the archery elk season on the reservation of the very last day of the season, which happened to be Sunday. At about 6 p.m., we set up a small portable blind near the waterhole 
and crawled inside. We waited quietly for about a couple of hours or so. We observed some cattle that came in to drink. There was also a coyote that came to drink. At 8.30 p.m., the sun went down behind the ponderosa trees. We decided to crawl out of the blind and break the blind down. As we were taking the portable blind down, we heard a high-pitched scream that came about 200 yards northwest of the waterhole. We stopped and listened, thinking it was a bull elk. Again, the scream came 30 seconds after the first scream. Right then I said, that don't sound like a bull elk at all. As I said that, another scream came which seemed to last a lot longer. At this point in time, we decided to leave the area. We didn't know if the scream was coming closer to our location. On the Navajo Indian Reservation, I was driving along the washboard dirt road, number 7, that heads east along the south side looking for a place to duck into a camp for the night. I was about 7 to 10 miles east, driving at about 20 miles per hour. It stepped out from the left side and walked across the road right in front of me, about 40 feet away or so, right at the edge of the bright part of my headlights, walking briskly, but in no hurry crossing the road and slightly away from me at the same time, so that it was probably 5 feet ahead when it reached the other side of the road. As soon as it crossed the road, and the little swale of a ditch, it bent over just as it was behind a bush, as if to take cover as soon as possible. At first, all I kept thinking was, I just saw an ape of some kind. But I quickly realized what it had to be. It wasn't particularly large, about six feet tall or so, but very solid for its size, and uniformly covered in dark brown hair. It never looked at me once. I only saw it for about three or four seconds, but saw it clearly. I ended up going back a little, turning north on a paved road that leads to the edge of the canyon, just a mile or so, and turning off into the woods a little to sleep in the back of my truck for the night, just two or three miles at most from where the sighting occurred. Well, this happened twice in our area, which is on the Navajo Reservation in the northeast corner of Arizona. Midwinter in 1979, myself and other neighborhood kids were playing in a recently fallen snow, and out of the darkness was heard the most terribly and interesting scream that we've ever heard. And this scream lasted for about 15 minutes on and off. Now at the time, I remember there being reports of a giant man taking sheep from corrals, but I didn't believe it until that night. The time must have been around 12 p.m., which is ironic about this incident is that it did not only happen once, but twice three years later in the same conditions, and there were low-key rumors at the time. Now, this hasn't bothered me, but I sure would like to know how it ever wandered into our region for a fact. In our oral history, our elders spoke of these men who will come and take you away if you're bad. I mean, just put two and two together. Now, this had to be a Bigfoot because on several recordings, the sounds are identical to what we heard that night. And, even on an episode of Sightings, the night cry was identical. This just gives me the creeps to know that at the time, we were probably being watched. One summer morning of the year 1989, myself and a forestry technician were just finishing up a routine spotted owl survey in the northern part of the Chuska mountain range. After calling for owls at a call point, just before sunrise, we began to walk back to the vehicle when we heard a loud, deep yell and roar from down below our position. The habitat was a mixed conifer stand within a deep, dark canyon. Since there are sheep camps throughout the mountain range, it did cross our mind that perhaps somebody, a human, was yelling but the distinct factor that myself and the technician had agreed upon was that the yell was very deep and long, which lasted approximately five seconds. After the vocalization, the echo itself retained the deepness of the sound as it traveled through the canyon below us. This was definitely not a human that had the lung capacity to make such a sound. After researching it a bit more recently, about Sasquatch sightings, audio clips, and more, my theory is the animal, whatever it was, may have been responding to our sounds, 
since we were calling with the imitated vocalization of the Mexican spotted owl. I've listened to several audio clips of recorded Sasquatch vocalizations and can see where one may have mistaken us for another creature of its kind. It was my first day of the 1981 Navajo deer season. I have hunted these Lukachukai mountains for deer throughout my teenage years with my brother T, Uncle DJ, and cousins. I was 20 years old then. It was about 7 a.m., November 7, 1981, when our hunting crew reached the top of the mountain, southwest of Cove, Arizona. The weather was cold with shifting fog. The ground was frozen from the drizzle the night before. Two cousins and I were to walk the upper mountain ridge that acred to the northwest. I packed my pack and loaded my rifle. By then, my cousins had already walked ahead of me, onto a well-used trail which rounded a hill to a saddle which splits the mountain range. I wanted to catch up with them, so instead of following the trail, I climbed up the hill and over. As I reached the top and began to go down the other side, I stopped and yelled my cousin's name to locate them. I first heard a crashing of oak brush below me about 40 to 50 yards to my left. I could not believe what I was seeing walking down the hill on two legs. The oak brush was about armpit height on the thing. By then, the smell had reached me, which was musky, wet smelly hair, an indescribable scent. I was shocked. The thought of shooting it came to mind as I watched it through my rifle scope, but it walked similar to a human. I did not shoot. I watched it walk down to the big trail below, about 70 to 80 yards and into the forest. I then hurriedly made my way back down the north towards the forest road we came up on and stayed on the road back to the meeting area to the northwest end of the ridge. I think it followed because of the movement I could hear in the oak brush while walking on the road. I shot once to scare whatever was moving in the oak brush. What I saw was a very large black hairy being that walked upright on two legs. The upper body was broad and muscular. The hair appeared coarse. The smell was bad. And I can only say what I saw that day was a Bigfoot. It's taken me a long time to write this because shortly after the incident, I managed to convince myself that it could not have been a Bigfoot. A few months later, a friend had a nearly identical incident at the same location, which made me reconsider. As a mechanical engineer, I am trained in the hard sciences, and as such, I am a scientist. I really don't believe in something unless there is hard evidence or the scientific community is in agreement. Since the incident and my friend's incident, I have been doing a lot of research and feel that there is substantial evidence that a forest primate exists in North America. As a scientist, my previous position was that something could exist, but there was not enough evidence to prove it. I do admit that I always have had an interest in the Bigfoot phenomenon and knew some things about it like wood knocking, howls, you know. I also took a natural anthropology class in college. My teacher was one of the most famous anthropologists of our time, and I learned well about all of the primates, early hominids, and of course, Gigantopithecus. My point is that I am an intelligent person who had an informed, skeptical position concerning the Bigfoot phenomenon but has come to believe that the forests are inhabited by either an early hominid or a great ape, or something in between. I am known for my situational memory and feel that my remembrance of the incident has not diminished. I have told my story many times and every time I get goosebumps. It was August of 2010. My wife, brother, father-in-law, and I were camping on the Mogollon Rim. We were in my favorite spot in a remote location on the Apache Sitgreaves Forest that I had been frequenting for about two years. We were not doing any particular activities like shooting or hunting. We were not riding quads or anything. It was a two-night camping weekend for us, and for the most part, we were just hiking and relaxing and observing elk. The oddest thing about this weekend was that there was almost nobody in the area of the forest. A lot of people avoid camping during the monsoon, although this weekend was basically dry. 
The closest campsite was about two miles away. It was occupied by two older couples whom I had spoke to earlier that day of the incident. The other notable observation was that it was a pitch black moonless night in which it must have been overcast because I could only see about three to five feet. In retrospect, I cannot imagine these two elderly couples creeping two miles into my camp on foot without lights just to disturb us in our sleep. Also, Arizonans are known for their gun toting. It is never wise to approach somebody's camp unannounced, especially in the middle of the night of a pitch black night. I have been an outdoorsman since I can remember and am also an accomplished hunter. I'm familiar with the Arizona fauna and the sounds they make. At about 12 a.m., I was awoken to the sound of two sticks cracking together near my RV trailer. The knocking sounded as if somebody had two girthy sticks, maybe two inches in diameter, and they were banging them together at a perfect two-second interval. Sometimes, the sticks sounded a little different, as if a knot had been struck, but the timing was never flawed. Now, a lot of people say, well, that could have been an elk's antlers or some bird cracking his beak but I have never heard of a known animal make this sound, let alone in perfect repetition for the duration that I heard it. But that wasn't the strangest part. The sound was translating through the forest rather quickly and without making additional sounds. The sound was emanating from an area on the back side of my trailer and receding away. It would then come closer and recede again. This was happening over and over, I would say that it was probably about 20 to 30 yards at the closest and went out an additional 50 to 70 yards away. My campsite was near a primitive road and the sound seemed to parallel the road, but I can't be sure. After lying in bed, listening to this for about two minutes, I decided that I needed to do something about this thing that was disturbing my camp. Familiar with the observance that Bigfoot's knocked wood, a Bigfoot did come to mind instantly, but I felt that as the patriarch. I needed to investigate and protect my family. My family members were all three asleep, and I believe there may have been some snoring going on which may have given the creature some comfort to continue doing this. I was sleeping in my underwear and decided to get dressed. I got dressed more quietly than ever before, or since I am certain that I made no sound that the creature could hear. I did not turn on any lights and was absolutely silent, feeling around for my clothes, shoes, and pistol. Once dressed, I moved silently to the trailer door, being careful not to shake the trailer or create any noise. This was actually quite easy because there is a door adjacent to my bed. I waited until the cracking sound had receded as far away as it sounded like it was going to get. And remember, the sound was emanating from the opposite side of my trailer. I slowly opened the door, again careful not to make a noise. The knocking sound continued. This is the part that freaks me out the most. As soon as I stepped outside, the knocking sound that seemed as far away from me as possible stopped. Now perhaps the trailer made a creaking sound when I put my weight on the metal step, but I had the distinct feeling that something, another creature, had seen me get out of the trailer. For some reason, the door opening did not cause the sound to stop, but when I got out, whatever was creating that cracking sound decided to stop, even though it was around 70 or 100 yards away. I had the feeling that if something saw me, it would be beyond the rear of my trailer. The door that I had just opened would have blocked the view of me from the front of the trailer. A position to the rear would have nicely triangulated a view of me and the wood knocking creature. In short, I got the distinct impression that there was a second creature serving as a lookout. Now the story does not stop there. I had a lousy flashlight which was unlit in one hand and my pistol in the other. I proceeded around the front of my trailer to the other side. Once I was on the other side, I was confronted by the pitch black woods in which I was certain that there were a couple of unknown creatures. Having the distinct feeling that there was something to the rear of my trailer. I shined the lousy flashlight directly towards the rear. This only lit up two very large pine trees that were about 12 feet in front of me. Shining the flashlight 
did, however, elicit a response. As soon as I shone the light, directly in front of me, but on the other side of the trees, perhaps about 20 to 40 yards away, something let out a whoop whoop. It was clear, it was distinct, and it was amazing. Before this incident, I never heard on TV that Bigfoots made a whoop whoop sound, so I am certain that this was not in my head. At that moment, I knew that there was something different from an elk, a bear, an owl, etc. that was disturbing my camp, and I also knew that there was a creature, and more than one. I felt like this was an alert call, signaling any additional creatures to leave the area. During my time outside of the trailer, I was very conscientious of the observances that Bigfoot is supposed to smell. I specifically sniffed the air, trying to get an indication of a bad smell, but never smelt anything. It was a temperate night. The air was a bit cool, probably in the low 60s, but I didn't smell a thing. Right after the whoop whoop, my wife began to stir, turning on lights and going to the restroom. I went back around the front of the trailer near the door I exited from, and my wife was standing there asking me what was going on. I told her that there is something out here. I don't know what it is, but there is something out here. Surprisingly, maybe because I knew they were scared away, I was able to fall asleep shortly thereafter. My wife told me that before she went back to sleep, that she heard a couple of knocks too. Of course, I had told her what I had heard and it may have been fresh on her mind as she started to fall asleep. She did wake me up to tell me, but I didn't hear anything and we both fell asleep. My brother and father-in-law never really woke up during the incident. I would say the incident lasted maybe 10 minutes from the moment I first woke up until the whoop whoop was heard. The next day, I searched the road and any sandy areas in the area for footprints. I am an experienced animal tracker but found zero tracks. As we discussed, the event I grabbed two ponderosa pine branches that I thought approximated what I had heard. I cracked them together and it sounded fairly similar. I experimented with different sizes and materials, oak, aspen, and pine. I felt like two inch diameter pine sticks with the bark removed sounded closest to what I had heard. The last week of November, that same year, my friend and his dad and brother were staying in my exact same campsite hunting elk. My friend heard the two second wood knocking rhythm translating through the woods just like I had for quite a few minutes. I believe his dad and brother did not really stir. He did not go out to confront it and it eventually stopped. <laughs>